first item on our agenda is a report on the completed grand list, and our assessor Betsy Quist is here. And you have in your packet uh, some information from her. Good evening. Good evening. Hi, Hi, Betsy. There should be probably a four-page packet stapled together. Yes. I mean, I'm not going to go through it all, but I'm just going to kind of give a few highlights of things that have changed, and there's some important things that obviously affect the uh, budget this year that have changed. <coughs> um, if you look on the first page, it, it's listed grand list changes. If you see, our grand list went up a little over $9 million, which is less than a 1% increase. It's better than we thought, mm. less than we wanted. Mm. Um, but it's, uh, you know, using the old mill rate, that's a $308,000 uh, tax increase. So that is a nice net. It's better than a negative. Um, some of the things that are pretty important about our, the grand list this year is if you flip to page two, one, Tony obviously will fill in some of the upper things. Uh, some of the grants that we receive from the state of Connecticut aren't always 100% funded um, the state-owned property the college and hospitals before the budget I think is finalized he gets a percentage that the state is going to fund that one of the things that they've cut out this year if you go down under the non reimbursement is the the manufacturing it's not a huge blow to us but it is in tax dollars forty six thousand dollars to us that we used to receive from the state of Connecticut, we now are required by the state of Connecticut to exempt all manufacturing that qualifies under that, the original statute, but it is now an unfunded mandate starting this year. So as you see the manufacturing, we have six companies that qualify and we have one company that has a truck, but we no longer will be reimbursed for that. Mostly all the other non-reimbursed exemptions are pretty much standard. They're um, the same up and down a little bit in terms of assessment. We won't know what the local elderly is or the um, local veterans or even our state elderly until May 15th, which is the cutoff date for that. But they don't vary by a huge amount every year. So they're pretty consistent. We vary by two or three applicants all along the way. So. On some of the highlights, um, we didn't have any more personal property um, accounts, but apparently it's good to be in the assisted living business because they did provide us with an additional $720,000 of new personal property this year. So they actually covered us in some of the places that we really fell because the Gale Group that's on Lunar Drive has no longer with, they're, in a, they're a publishing company, and they have decided to no longer manufacture here. So they disposed of about $550,000 of their manufacturing equipment this year. So that was a nice wash, because that would have been a big hit. We also lose a good percentage every year of our grand list, almost $2 million on depreciation of the power lines that come through. So that is another thing that we every year have to, you know, make up. Um, and then we had Oak Lane. And we lost a good portion of Oak Lane's personal property. But I did do a walk through, and I think I did report to you last time I was here with uh, the daughter of the new owner, fabulous woman. They're, they have great ideas. And we have a very good listing of what's there. They're looking to bring in a lot of new stuff, do a lot of new things. So I'm hoping by next year when I do this report, I'll say to you we have 500,000 new dollars worth of equipment at Oak Lane. You know? So I'm staying on the positive side of that. And for my last positive side, um, well, I have two last positive sides. The new uh, building at 245 Amity Road this year brought in $500,000 of personal property. So, if, you know, it's nice to have a little commercial in town if you're thinking about that in the future. And then a, a good sign of the economy for my last upside is we had 97 fewer motor vehicles this year, but we increased our motor vehicle grant list by over $6 million. So people are buying new cars. 
So that shows that, you know, the economy is turning somewhere, whether they're buying more expensive cars or more cars or newer cars. I'll, I'll take it as more newer cars. So that, that's a good note. So pretty much that's, you have all the other figures. They kind of mean what they mean. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Thank you. Okay. Have a good night. Good night. Thank you. The next item on our agenda is a presentation from the Southern Connecticut Gas Company about extending their service. And this is going to be a very welcome uh, extension of service. So uh, Val Farrow is here uh, to uh, coordinate this presentation. You can introduce the people from UI over here and we'll make the presentation. Great. <coughs> good evening, everyone. And I just would like to. Uh, Thank you for selecting Chihi for this opportunity to allow the gas company to uh, present this proposal. Let me introduce uh, Michael Stein. He's a key accounts manager with the UI company, and Woodbridge is one of his, one of his customers. Uh, also, Michael Smolik, key account manager with Southern Connecticut Gas Company, <coughs> and John Dobles who is Director of Marketing at Southern Connecticut Gas Company, and he will be delivering this presentation for you. Thank you, Val. Mr. Shee, thank you very much for your courtesy to have us here tonight to uh, talk to your folks about, uh, which I think is a very exciting proposal for our company and for the town of Woodbridge. And um, as we go through this presentation, we can show you that uh, it, there, there are some good things that we can do together. First, I thought it would be interesting to um, tell who we are. Um, Southern Connecticut Gas is the natural gas provider in the town of Woodbridge. We do have some customers here already at some of those streets that the lady mentioned we're, we're on. Um, we are part of the UIL holding family of companies. Our holding company is UIL. Um, it's actually located in New Haven, so we're a local company. Uh, we've been around for over 160 years here in Connecticut. So, uh, we're uh, very well established in the communities that we serve. Uh, UIL is made up of uh, UI, which is the electric provider for this town and for many others, Connecticut Natural Gas, Southern Connecticut Gas, which is the company that would be serving you here in Woodbridge, and Berkshire Gas, which is a gas, small gas company up in Western Massachusetts. These are the service territories that we are currently serving. Um, in this area here, uh, in the gray, it's UI and Southern Connecticut Gas. <coughs> Up in the Hartford area, Connecticut Natural Gas. And then this back down here actually shows the western part of Massachusetts, and it's in the Berkshires that we serve. I thought it'd be interesting to just talk a little bit about natural gas before we uh, get into the actual proposal. Um, natural gas serves uh, over 65 million households here in the United States, 5 million businesses, 1,800 electric generation units, and most of the electric generation that comes on is now powered by natural gas, not by oil, and not by coal. And we have some very good benefits to talk about with natural gas. The first being that we're the cleanest fossil fuel. Uh, natural gas on an energy equivalent basis emits 27% less CO2 than oil. Um, and it allows us to help the state and the federal government um, work towards its goal of reducing any greenhouse gas emissions here in the state of Connecticut. It's also a very dependable fuel. Uh, it's piped directly to your home or to your business. Um, you think back to a winter when we actually had snow last year. Uh, oil trucks were having trouble getting down streets to, to fill up your oil tanks. Um, our product is 24 hours a day, seven days a week, piped directly to your home. We have a, a, a staff of service technicians that are available on call 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We offer service contracts. So we have dependable service also that is out there that's available uh, on a contract basis or on an hourly basis. <coughs> we also have a very efficient fuel. Um, over the last 40 years, we've continually made progress in the efficiency of the natural gas burning equipment. Uh, we have natural gas boilers now that are 96, 97, 98% efficient. And over the past 40 years, the average home uses 40% less, less natural gas than it did 
40 years ago because of those technological improvements through the years. The one that I like to talk about the most is its domestic fuel. Um, we've all read in the papers all the issues with Iran right now and <coughs> oil and not wanting to sh sell it to the West and how volatile the price of oil may continue to be based on that. And you're talking about us paying gasoline prices much higher by the summertime. Um, and I'll talk about it on the next slide, but 99% of natural gas comes from North America, either the United States or Canada. So one of the things that we like to try to say is that the dollars that you spend on natural gas actually stay in this continent. They stay in, in the United States and in Canada. They're not being sent over to countries that were not friendly with us. Um, and it's something that, that stays right here in, in, in the United States. 84% um, comes from US, 15% from Canada. And the other 1% is called liquid natural gas. Liquid natural gas comes from Trinidad and Tobago and, and the islands. It comes in by big tankers into Boston get shipped down here and we actually have a natural gas plant uh, storage tank in Milford, Connecticut, uh, right along the Lusitonic River. And what we use that tank for is on the coldest days of the year, we don't have <laughs> enough gas in our pipelines to serve everybody. And so we have the storage locally here as a cold, real cold, they take it from the gaseous form, make it into liquid and we store it. And then when it, on the coldest days of the year, we put it back into the system and uh, we kind of peak shave that plant. So it's nice to say that 99% comes from North America. So it's a growth fuel, domestic supply, uh, dominant in its market share, any new construction, if somebody's building houses and they can, we can get to them, they want to put it in natural gas, they don't want to put it in any other, any, any other fuel. And we have a, a growth goal here to continue to expand our companies. And the only way we do it is to come to folks like you and talk about how we can expand into your community. So what's our proposal here to Woodbridge? <coughs> we'll start off by um, looking to extend the natural gas lines that we have. Um, I'll go to the, this map and then I'll go back to this slide. <coughs> right now, natural gas ends right here. This is on uh, Amity Road and at the Jewish Community Center. We would look to extend natural gas on Amity Road, down Center Road, to Beecher School at this end, and to one of the houses of worship down here, and then the town buildings here in the center of town, and also go up to Amity High School. So the green that you see on this map would be the extension that we're here to talk about today. And we picked this route um, because of what's along it. And as you can see, as we'll get further into this, is that the um, Amity Regional High School and Beecher School are big loads. And those are what is going to make this work for, for all of us. Um, that's 12,000 feet of new plastic gas main. Uh, we would make an investment in this town and in infrastructure of in excess of a million dollars. Um, Southern Connecticut Gas would be responsible for the installation um, and the restoration. The, the town of Woodbridge and the Connecticut Department of Transportation would issue us permits to be able to do that. Um, and in certain areas, we would like to try to get off the pavement and get into the curb so we don't have to disturb <coughs> the pavement uh, and, and, and take away the paving issues. What makes this work is the town uh, having seven buildings, um, the Amity Regional School District <coughs> having a big high school, we have several houses of worship that we've talked to, the Roman Catholic Church, the, uh, the Jewish Temple. We, we've talked to a bunch of folks here. Um, and these people would agree to convert <coughs> their oil heating to natural gas over a certain period of time. What we do then is we take what we call on the loads, um, what, would, what revenues would come in from those buildings. We take a look at the construction costs, we run it through a model, and we make sure that it, financially that it works. And we've preliminarily done that, and if we get the loads to come on in the next two years, um, we can bring this gas to, to Woodbridge with no cost to the town. The town would then, and the, and the other folks would be responsible for um, whatever improvements need to be done inside the buildings, new furnaces, new burners, um, and upgrading the equipment. Um, but as far as the infrastructure goes, 
that would not be a responsibility of the town or the houses of worship or the boards of education. <coughs> the other thing that's important here to also is that along those routes that I showed is that we'll pass 72 houses. Um, so 72 folks in Woodbridge would have additional folks would have um, the ability to hook up to natural gas and to have natural <coughs> gas in their home. Um, and once we get that footprint in town, there are possibilities that we would continue to expand into other neighborhoods. And we're talking to a gentleman that showed us he lives right off of uh, the road going down to Beecher. And uh, you know that would be the kind of neighborhood expansion that we would like to continue to do. We go out, we talk to people, we, we target market that group, and we try to continue to get more people to sign up and they can enjoy the same benefits that we're here to talk about today. So that's our route. Um, as I said before, the proposal is based on these people converting, uh, these, these entities converting. And it comes a little tricky because there's, you know, it's, it's not one person making the decision for all those groups. It's probably three or four decision makers along the way. Um, and if we get this to work, we get everybody on board, um, get the budget approved and signed off on contracts approved, you know, we could start this construction in spring and summer of 2012. Um, if we've talked with the town mm -hmm. folks and with the folks in the uh, Board of Ed, and probably the first account that would get hooked up and on would be the Amity High School. And they start school at the end of August. So we'd want to be in there, out of there by like August 20th so that they could just roll out and have their, um, be the first one to come on. The uh, pavement restoration is always a big topic when we come. You know, we're going to dig up your roads. Our pipes are in the ground. Um, so there's a temporary, very good temporary patch that gets put down first. We let it settle for a couple of months um, so that when we do the final pavement, that it will be done very well and you'll be very happy with it going forward. And there are specifications on the state roads and on the town roads on what type of pavement that we have to do. So it all comes down to numbers. And we put together a slide here that gives some pricing illustration. We worked with uh, the folks here in the town to get um, the number of gallons of oil that was consumed uh, for the, all the town facilities together, for Beecher School and for Amity School. <coughs> In your budget that we just, the young lady was talking about here, uh, I believe next year for the price of oil, we're gonna, they're gonna build in a three, $3.25. That's what oil's gonna cost to the town next year. So that would be the cost for, for oil. We then took the number of gallons that um, we have up on the screen for those three entities, and we converted them into how many cubic feet of gas that we would need to do the same amount of heating. And those are the numbers. And we run them through our cost model, what our current <laughs> costs are today, and 67,000, 72,000, and 107,000. So the potential savings, if you take the oil, and you look at the gas, for the Woodbridge Town facilities would be 77,000, for Beecher School 111,000, and for Amity High School 171. And you add those three up, you come into the 361. You know, we have some lawyers in the room, but <laughs> we always say this at the bottom, you know. Past performance does not guarantee future results. <laughs> if we had that crystal ball, I wouldn't be here because I had to be out on Wall Street doing some kind of hedging or something like that. Um, what we've talked about with the town is, you know, don't rely on us. Go talk to other folks. Go over to talk to your neighbors in Orange. We converted Mary Tracy School. They've been on gas for about five or six months. They're already calling us. They want two other schools converted over in the town of Orange. And they also want us to run gas to their pool at the High, <coughs> High, Plains? High, Plains. High Plains School. So, you know, you know, I know you know Mr. Zioli over there. So, you know, talk to them, find out what their experience is. And you look also in the federal, um, the federal government has the Energy Information Administration, and they project energy prices going forward. And the natural gas prices going forward are uh, predicted to stay stable, where oil continues to be volatile up and down. But, I mean, that's a good number. Um, it's, a, it's a number I love to present. For many years, you know, we were not able to have that big of a, a savings, but now it's real. Um, we converted last year uh, in the state of Connecticut about seven 
a little short of 7,000 homes from oil to natural gas. And the people that are doing it uh, seem to be very satisfied with it. The other thing that we've turned the town on to too is the uh, energy efficiency of initiatives that are available. You all pay through your electric bill and through your gas bill to the uh, Connecticut Energy Efficiency Fund. Um, I, I always make a pitch also when I talk about energy efficiency is to talk about your individual home. In the state of Connecticut, we have a whole um, HES program, Home Energy Solutions Program. It's a $75 copay. And they come out and they do about five or $600 worth of air sealing and um, work at your house where they put light bulbs and shower heads. Um, so if you haven't done that, 1-800-WISE-USE um, is the phone number to call. Um, you should take a look at that as for your own home. If you heat with oil, you heat with, uh, I think there's money available for uh, oil audits right now um, and fuel blind. So everything that I'm saying today, just think about it for your home too to, to do that. And I'll talk to the folks on TV also. Um, but we also have this program that Mike um, has worked with for many years called the Energy Conscious Blueprint. So as the town goes out and gets prices for replacing equipment or replacing burners, um, really new design equipment, uh, a lot of times what these programs will do is, you know, they'll take a standard efficiency boiler, we put a higher one in, we could get some dollars for the town to help along with those costs also. So we've told, turned uh, the administrators here into that, uh, onto that program. And uh, as we go forward, we'll, we'll be right there to help support that. So that's what I have to say. Um, I think it's a, a very uh, bold proposal for both the town and for our company uh, to work together. And I, again, thank you for your courtesies along the way. We've been working together for a couple months, and we've gotten to this point uh, with uh, some very good cooperation back and forth. And with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions from uh, the board. So yes. John, just before we get to the yes. questions, uh, one of the factors we have to take into account is the cost for the town of Woodbridge to convert the gas. Yes. And yes. we're in the process of preparing those numbers and we will have those of it. We don't have them here tonight, but we will be have those to submit to, into our budget for, for next year. And uh, I know that uh, Val's been working with your folks to help give this name to contractors to be able to, to take a look at that for right. you. So we'll be, we're willing to help on that too whenever we, whenever we can. And then the other thing is that any of those uh, residents who are along the line of the extension of the gas line, they're not charged for the, for the, uh, the presence of that new gas line. It's only if they uh, decide to tie into That's it, correct. is there a charge? Yeah, there's no charge to them. Um, what we would actually do on the, on the people that are along the route is every one of those jobs would then stand on their own. The, the, gas is, the gas main would be covered under these projects. So the main would be in front of their house. We now have to run a service to their house. Usually, if somebody's converting hot water and heat from oil to natural gas, we can do about a 90-foot service from the street to your house without a contribution. If it's a big, huge setback or if it's uh, you know, a back building or whatever, then we have to you know, get out our uh, measuring sticks and, and figure that out and put it through our model. But if it's 90 feet, there's no rock there, um, you know, we could usually run it um, to that house with them, then they would then be responsible for changing out their heating equipment, which is not, you know, a small decision to be made. It's probably somewhere between five and $10,000 for those folks to be able to convert at that point in time. They have a newer furnace, they could do it a lot cheaper if they just change the boiler out, I'm sorry, just the burner out. But uh, that would be for folks that probably didn't need to replace their whole furnace at this point in time. And I'm sorry, did you I, No, my questions were all answered except, for, answer. yeah, <laughs> except for one. Um, okay. It's not mandatory, right? On the, uh, not this at is all. a complete decision. Complete voluntary on the, on the The only thing that's mandatory is that we get those big buildings to sign up. Right. Because okay. that's what makes it work. Sure. You know? The big buildings and the town buildings. We have to have agreement that everybody is going to be in on this. Right. As the Giants say, we're all in, you know, okay. but uh, and, and uh, we have, have to make sure those are there. Do you have something going forward um, in terms of the rest of the town or your... Well... I'm not in those, yeah. those areas. Okay. Tell, so. <laughs> <laughs> it's difficult to, for us to justify running into mm -hmm. other areas of the town without those big loads. Mm -hmm. Amity has a very big load, Beecher has a very big load mm -hmm. in the town buildings and the, the churches and the, the synagogues that we're talking about. Mm -hmm. They have good loads. Um, unless you have another school in your area or, you know, um, it becomes more difficult for us mm -hmm. to do it. Um, I would say that, you know, public policy, 
may change over time where there may be some other dollars available to do that but um, to give you the straight answer it's difficult it would be difficult for us to get gas in the whole um, uh, town of Woodbridge. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, I had a question about what, what sounds to me like a pretty ambitious schedule and you said uh, DOT permits are going to be required. How, how do you get the state to move that? <laughs> we, we work with them every day. We work with the state every day. To, we open up a lot of roads. So <coughs> it, the permitting process to open up a state road is not like going to DDP to try to get something else done. Um, we have a very good working relationship with the folks. We work with the local folks. Um, and, you know, within a couple of weeks, we can usually get a permit to, no to do that. Yeah. Um, have you all met with, uh, with our public Public works. People? Yes, we have. Yes, we've had a series of meetings leading up to this presentation yeah. tonight over the past several months. Yeah. Joe and Hal Hours coordinated all these meetings and put this together. Great. Great. On that topic of um, getting gas potentially to other parts of the town, um, so I understand townwide that's a, that's a big challenge. But if let's say Beecher Road, yes. So you're going down Beecher Road anyway. Mm -hmm. What is your What's your process for how do you figure out if it's worth it going down the side streets? Yeah, to try so look, to like Beecher Road people? here, right? Um, <coughs> we come down here, and there's some other, like the Stale Drive here, okay? We would go there and we would pull everybody on the street. We tend to like to try to get somebody on the street that might be a champion, and then they kind of talk to their neighbors too. But we'll go out, we'll do mailings to them, we'll do telephone calls to them, and the one thing that's key, and we talked, somebody asked the question, is it mandatory? But we can come to your street and say to you, you know, are you interested in gas? Yeah, I'm interested. I'd love to go. I'd love to save half of what my, what my uh, oil price is right now. But when we come to you at, to make that decision, you have to say that you're going to do it and you're going to do it within six months. So it's, a, it's really a firm commitment on the part of the, of the homeowners. So our process is to do neighborhood um, meetings. We, we've done in Orange, we ran from uh, a part in Orange to up to 34 where they built that Fieldstone Village. So along that route, you know, we had an opportunity of like 70 homes. Um, we actually held, held a meeting in a restaurant where we did a presentation to folks that they could come in and similar to this one and talk to them. We've gone to people's basements, <coughs> got eight neighbors together and done a presentation together. So that's the way we continue to move our lines. And, that, and, and honestly, that's the way we continue to, uh, to uh, expand our business. So that, that is something we're very interested in. Um, do they all pass? No, they don't all pass. Can we get enough people? But maybe not this year, but maybe next year, we'll, you know, we'll, we'll get enough people. Well, um, can I follow up on that a little bit? So let's say you come up to, you take Beecher to Rimmon. Rimmon is a main road. And is it based on 50% interest of the, of the and, then, and then let's say it is 50% interest, then the infrastructure cost you're no longer absorbing that, or who's absorbing that infrastructure cost? Well, what happens is that what we take a look at is, if, say, say we came to this ribbon right here, right? And we wanted to go t to up to this end, okay? And so we would pull all these houses along here, and we would say, how many houses? There's 14 houses there. And we would say, we've we got six that are interested, and they're going to put in hot water, they're going to do cooking, maybe a dryer, and a gas grill. Yeah, but they're not going to pay for your $1 no, no, million here we go. infrastructure. No, no, but that's not a million dollars either. Okay. But then we, we take a look at what, it, what does it actually cost to run that main. Mm -hmm. And we put it through a, a financial model. And if the payback for us, right now we're on a 20-year payback. Because uh, once we get a customer, we have them. You know, and so we do a 20-year payback analysis of that. And if it passes, there's no contribution. If it doesn't pass, then we ask the people that they may have to contribute towards that construction. Uh huh. Okay. I think the gentleman. Uh, so no kidding. Yeah. Questions the board of selectmen. Okay. Uh, go ahead. Yep. One more question. Um, you mentioned uh, <coughs> sometimes using the shoulder and sometimes using the road. How do you make the choice? And like, do you know where on your <coughs> route there? You no, we do, right now we don't. Um, the choice would be, you know, how much is how much is the planting strip available to us? How close it is to the road? Is there rocks in the way? Um, those are the kind of decisions that we use to make to make that. And then, you know, once we would get to the point where we would sign agreements, we would take this and we would go into, you know, um, detailed engineering design 
and where there's people out there doing test holes and all that stuff to be able to make sure that we engineer it correctly. Go ahead. Anyone in the audience like? Yes, sir. <clears throat> yeah, I'm on 48 Center Road. Yes. On your proposed new we'll line. sign up. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm ready. It's actually very easy for me. So you bring the line right to the side of my house. That's correct. Because my furnaces are actually propane, just put in a year ago. Okay. And so it's just a matter of turning off. And, and we, and our, I mentioned before that we have, I mentioned before that we have service people. We can even help you with the conversion from propane what's, over. What's the savings? Do you know from propane to uh, natural? Our current situation right now is that. Um, in the southern service territory for residential purposes, if you're heating with natural gas, our equivalent price is $1.75. So if you're paying $3.20 or something like that, uh, comparable to, I'm not sure of the propane, up to date on the propane prices, but if somebody's paying oil right now at uh, $3.60 <coughs> delivered to your house, we would be the equivalent of $1.75. So I'm 2 220 for a propane a gallon. Okay. And actually, it's less uses less natural gas. Uh, I'll, I'll defer to my engineer here. Is that is that correct, Mike? Yeah, it, roughly, it's almost the same conversion. So your propane gas, you're roughly in the uh, just shy of two dollars per uh, propane gallon equivalent. Well, I also have a 500 gallon tank in my yard, which I'd like to get rid of. Sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. That, also that would work. Okay. Mm. Well, question for you, sir. Yes. Well, how do you work the consortium? For buying natural gas, <coughs> the way that is presently the town of Woodridge uh, and its local communities around it buy oil at a fixed price for the year. Uh, I was told that, that if the town can, they still have a consortium that would buy natural gas for Amity, Beecher, and the other town buildings. Yes, um, we're in the business of delivering natural gas. We make our revenue off of the transportation using our, our lines. We don't make anything off the actual the commodity portion. There are marketers in the state of Connecticut that also sell natural gas and they deliver it through our pipes. Um, the town would be able to go to a consortium um, and join up and buy all that through a marketer and maybe get a better price for that. Also. Second part to the <coughs> question, please. Are there any communities that form a consortium that includes the private residences of the community? Uh, in the state of Connecticut, um, you have to buy your gas bundled, uh, commodity and transportation. Uh, there is no choice for residential customers in the state. Um, there hasn't been. The only choice that people have is on the commercial side. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? So then just for the Board of Selectmen, going forward, what we have to do is come up with the figures for the cost for conversion. We hope to have those for the meeting uh, in, in late March, which right. had to be approved by the Board of Selectmen and Board of Finance, and then approved at the annual town meeting. And then in addition to that, we would have to sign a contract with Southern Connecticut mm -hmm. Gas Company, committing ourselves and all the town buildings to purchase gas, and that contract will have to be worked out uh, between us and the and Southern Connecticut That's Gas right. Company. But there are certain items in there that are yeah. probably non-negotiable. So. Um, yeah, we've supplied a, a template to Joe, um, and I believe uh, you know the council. Your council should look at it if there's any things that you're interested in changing the boilerplate. Um, we could we could discuss that, but um, we sign these a lot of times, and there's not a lot of changes that we make to them. But is there any uh, duration guarantee? Yes, there is. Um, our normal contract calls for once we sign it that someone has um, to hook up what they said they're going to do within six months of the contract. We've already talked to the folks here about extending that for like Beecher School. There's renovations going on there. It won't be on until 2013. So those are the kind of things that we've been negotiating. But once you sign up, you have to stay with gas. So you have to use gas for your primary heating going forward. Forever? When do you want to switch back to oil? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's something you wouldn't do that. Or there wouldn't we be a, pro there would be a there, right? prohibition. There's not a legal term. Really, the gas company, if we ran uh, two miles a main in this case, and let's just say behind the scenes there's a two-year payback for the utility, because really the rate base is financing the construction on behalf of the customer, new customers coming on. So as long as the uh, stranded acid is paid off, the utility wouldn't enforce ever switching back. You know. If somebody switched, came from, signed a contract for one year and then switched right during that year. So it's really the payback. And in this case, you know, it, it just never happens that somebody, you know, lately would end up 
switching back. doesn't make sense. Of, right. but, but it's a good legal question, and that's often what comes up. The, the template, the contract that's signed for all the municipalities is really a template that every town that we serve, you know, is pretty common language, but all good questions. I, I have or, one more question, yeah, actually. Yep. One more question. Um, obviously, we only speak for the town here, and we're talking about, I guess you don't really convert houses of worship in the literal sense. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you're not going to say different houses of worship. Right. Um, There's always a chance of conversion. You never know. Right. You know, by my count, there's three or four of those. Do, do those houses of worship, will you go forward if only the town signs up, or does everybody have to be a part of this in order for you to make this infrastructure? It's a hard investment? question to answer. Right I now, only ask hard questions. Ah, yeah. Those are good ones. Yeah. The way that we figured this now is that all those votes would come on. Now, if you have commitments from them, uh, not firm, but verbal kind of that we're interested. We've now, had now we'll get to the contract with all of these people. So We've had meetings with so them. Everybody's toe is in the water. You know, one of the gentlemen that represents the Roman Catholic Church here has been involved in our meetings. Uh, the gentleman, uh, you, you've been involved in our meetings, so um, I'm feeling good about about them. Um, and if one small church backed out, it might still work, but we'd have to redo the calculation over again. So let us pray. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> I got you. Right. So well, thank you very much. Yeah, and I know you got a busy agenda here, so we'll uh, make our way out here. Lawrence. Yeah, I would just point out, too, the, uh, the figures you had on the wall, it was, it was an aggregate figure for Amity, so savings to the town would just be... Whatever. A it's portion. 31 percent. Yeah. Yeah. Right. But yeah. Amity realizes yeah. yeah. But I understand right. that. So, we're not going to take any votes here tonight, but there, is there a consensus that we would want to proceed with this? Absolutely. Okay. All right. Yeah. Would yeah. it be possible to copy the uh, presentation? Sure. I'll email sure. that over to uh, Joe and then he'll get it out to you folks. Okay. 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 Thank you. So, we'll proceed the with that. The only piece that I won't have in there, well, I might have to change it a little bit, is the map. Um, there are some guests things that are marked down there that we don't normally give that up for folks for security reasons, okay. but we could do one, you know, just on a Google map to show you where That's it's fine. going. That's fine. It'd be a different map you'll probably see in there. Yeah, it's more with the text. Yeah. Good. Okay. Thanks, Thanks very much. Thank you. 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 Next item on our agenda is the proposed the pesticide policy for town owned property. And uh, David and Virginia Snyder are here. They've been the prime movers behind uh, uh, this policy. And so, uh, David and Virginia, the floor is yours. Thank you. We have in our packet, I think, the minutes from the uh, Recreation Commission. I assume you also have. Yeah, well, I, I, I was just kind of waiting for that since I couldn't hear myself. Uh, <laughs> just so you know, I think most of you know, I'm Dave Schneider, this is my wife, Virginia. Uh, and I just wanted to start by saying that uh, this is the 50th anniversary of the publication of Silent Spring by uh, Rachel Carson, which I think most of you know sort of set in motion uh, the realization that we needed to think in terms of what we were doing to our environment uh, by the use of chemical uh, pesticides in, in our land. And, <clears throat> and it's not simply uh, people we're talking about, but it also uh, animals and insects, uh, particularly bees have been harmed. Uh, and, and I don't, I mean, there's lots and lots of literature about the, the problems with, with pesticide usage. and. Uh, we can talk about those if, if you need to, uh, but I think um, we'll assume <clears throat> most people are, are, are aware of those. Uh, uh, my wife and I have been involved sort of in this for a long time. Thirty-some years ago, we uh, 
convinced our pediatrician neighbor not to accept a gift from his wife of a pesticide application on their lawn because after he checked into it, he realized it was not a good thing. Uh, <clears throat> uh, Jenny was actually involved uh, with uh, Beecher Road School some 18 years ago in an ad hoc committee to eliminate uh, pesticides at the school there, uh, which was before the state mandate did that. So <clears throat> I think it's been about December of 2010 that, uh, that this board uh, referred to Joe Hellauer and Adam Parsons to look into the possibility of a, of a pesticide policy. And so we were glad to be involved with them. And just so you know a little bit of the background of what we've been doing, um, I think we've had at least six meetings <clears throat> with my wife and I, uh, Joe and Adam. And at least three of those meetings Mr. Sheehy and Mr. Genovese were there, I believe, it's about three each, I think. Um, <clears throat> at least two meetings, Warren Connors was there so that we could discuss the pesticide issue on the roads and how that would affect that issue. Um, then we drafted up a proposed policy, which was uh, acceptable to, to that group of people that had been meeting, uh, which is sent to Mr. Weiner. Uh, he reviewed it, we discussed it, we made a few uh, changes uh, at his suggestion, um, and then it was, I think, brought back to the board here in December, which was sent to the Recreation Commission for uh, <clears throat> their input, which was done, and I'll, I'll get to that a, a bit later in my uh, presentation. Uh, in the meantime, uh, some of the things that we did were look at other towns that had had banned the use of pesticides, particularly on their playing fields. And uh, in particular, uh, my wife talked with people in Cheshire, Greenwich, and Branford, <clears throat> all of which have had a no pesticide policy for some significant period of time. Uh, all of them reported uh, that they were very satisfied and very happy with what had been done um, and, and that they had not had any problems with it. Uh, we went out to two of those towns, uh, Greenwich and Cheshire, and, and took pictures of, of their fields. And you want to yeah. pass that around? Uh, These were in May of last year, the end of May. condition was at that point. Greenwich is first and then Cheshire. Cheshire had many more fields, but she's involved. Branford's been doing this for 10 years. I think Greenwich is about six years. And Cheshire is at least six years, too. <clears throat> and then we reviewed policies that, that other towns and, and municipalities had put into effect, and particularly <clears throat> from Westchester County and Suffolk County, uh, both of whom have had uh, fairly extensive policies and, uh, and have banned uh, the use of pesticides on, on uh, virtually all of their county-owned property. Um, and I would also point out that this is not the first time that the board has taken a position on this. Uh, Fitzgerald property has been uh, supposedly pesticide-free for some time. I say supposedly because I think some people are sneaking in there from time to time, but uh, <clears throat> most of it is not. And as you may recall, uh, the, the use of Roundup was banned with the uh, chestnut tree project uh, because of the keeping it organic. And, and although the Massaro Farm had no intention of using pesticides, the town required in the lease with Massaro Farm that, that it be kept organic and no pesticides used. So this is not exactly something new for this uh, board. So if you, I'm going to just run through the policy uh, to highlight some things <clears throat> and obviously answer any questions. But uh, there's three whereas clauses which I think are important to consider. I mean, the first one simply is that the pesticide usage has, has been linked to a number of diseases in addition to cancer, uh, and particularly with children. Um, and and this, uh, 
one article f uh, from Pesticides and Playing Fields suggests that we do spend a lot of time worrying about the safety of our children, and yet the common everyday practices we use on their playing fields are unnecessarily exposing them to carcinogens, developmental toxins, and other problems, and it goes on to discuss those. So <clears throat> I think that's one important thing to keep in mind. The second is that the state of Connecticut uh, has banned the uh, use of pesticides on a school property for children up through uh, grade eight. Uh, New York State's actually banned it through high school. And the third thing is that I think it would be very important for the town uh, to, to be an example to private landowners in town because uh, so much of the pesticides uh, that are used far more in residential usage than in agriculture, for example. And, and it's not just your property that's being put on. There's been studies showing that groundwater uh, in, in Woodbridge as well as elsewhere uh, Somebody puts it on their land, it goes in the uh, underwater ground system and it pollutes everyone. So uh, hopefully the town could set an example uh, that, that could be used by private homeowners. So <clears throat> very simply, the policy defines pesticide and it defines it in exactly the same way that the state statute uh, defines it in the one banning the, in the uh, schools. Um, it also sets up uh, an ad hoc pest management committee, which I'll discuss in a minute. And then the regulation would simply be that, that no one, no town employee, agent, contractor, or subcontractor can use a lawn care pesticide, which is defined uh, on town property, subject to certain exceptions and certain exemptions. The exceptions are are pretty much ones that have been contained in most of the policies <clears throat> that we've looked at and, and, and are somewhat obvious. Uh, I mean, you can use containerized bats, so if you're trying to catch a mouse or something, that's not <laughs> prohibited. Uh, if you want to spray a pesticide on yourself, you can do that. Uh, and then I think the most important exception to keep in mind is give, the first selectman has the power to uh, authorize a temporary use of a particular pesticide when there's a public need. And, uh, and in doing so, uh, <clears throat> the person requesting it or the organization uh, needs to specify what the problem is and, and why they need it. and then attempt to give recommendations for why it wouldn't be needed in the future. But I think what's important about this is that it, uh, it's a, a way to make sure that if, if there is a public need for using a pesticide for some emergency, it can be done. And, uh, and I think that needs to be kept in mind, but some of the people who may be concerned about this uh, and come up with a, a, a lumber of horrors that could happen. Some, time, some places they've used the health department people or the resources. Cornell Extension or on Long Island and health department people. Because you can't just willy-nilly say, I feel like it's brain. Right. <laughs> no reason. There's two exemptions. And one is we've exempted the golf course uh, because it just seemed like this was something that was needed to be done at this point. Uh, the second one is weed control on land abutting town-owned streets and roads. According to Mr. Connors, th this is not done very often, maybe every other year uh, for poison ivy that grows up around some of the guardrails. And uh, he's assured us it's not used extensively and he's trying to move away from it. But there is that exemption from the policy for that particular issue. Uh, <clears throat> now. We do set up an ad hoc <laughs> pest management committee, which uh, is much less extensive than what is, seems to be in place in many of these others. Uh, I know Mr. Kenefick is concerned about more committees. I think we're all concerned about more committees. Uh, the intent of this is not to have another commission that meets every month and, and has to think of something to do. Uh, but I think the important thing that would consist of the town administrator and two citizens appointed by the Board of Selectmen 
would, would be first to provide assistance to the first selectman in the case of, of needing to respond to a request for an emergency use of, of, of a pesticide. Uh, and it would also work with the Board of Selectmen for possible amendments to this policy, uh, hopefully help with any budgetary issues and the kind of things that would hopefully take uh, any of the burden of sort of administering this off of, at least some of it off of the selectmen themselves. Um, so that's, that's basically the, the policy itself. And, and I, before we get to some questions, um, <clears throat> I think that in talking about this with various people, there have been two concerns raised, uh, as I put them. Uh, one is potential cost, and the other is what I call uh, the beauty of the playing fields. Uh, the cost, from what has been determined, uh, and, and, and Adam Parsons uh, is very knowledgeable about using uh, organic methods, is very committed to using uh, organic methods. Uh, and one of the things that would be needed is, uh, I think sometimes referred to an overseeder or what do you? Well, the aerovators or aerators, some equipment. Um, Adam has given us a proposed uh, cost <coughs> for implementation of this program, and Adam is here uh, tonight. Oh, is that? Um, which, which I believe is for all fields in the town, Adam, or is it? Okay. I don't know if you've seen this uh, day. Uh, uh, I, I may have, but I'm not sure. It's been some time, so I'm not sure if it's been updated or not. Did we get a copy? You're welcome. Yes. Oh, you should have a copy. Yes. We had a PDF to you yesterday. I didn't get, get it. it. Did you get it? I didn't get it. Did you get it? I'm going to I saw I saw the numbers on in the minutes, but I don't remember. Right, getting. I didn't. Okay, so why don't we make a copy for everybody? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's it. Okay, I, I had not seen these particular okay. numbers. They're they're kind of uh, in line with what I had, uh, I had seen. Um, Um, private homeowners, uh, farmers, uh, is it just town land? Is yes. It? So yeah. w the residents and, and farmers and other private landowners are not affected by this? Well, farmers, the, the Masaro farm is already affected. Right, other than the Masaro farm. How about, how about farmers who lease land? Or, or, you know, we, we let them lease. It, it would their, affect That's the town the land, so that would impact them. It's well. in their okay, use that they care about pesticides. Okay. It's but, already in the lease. Okay. But to answer your question, I mean, right now in Connecticut, uh, there's a preemption statute that says that no town can uh, to, can ban a pesticide or be more strict in the use, banning of pesticides than the state law. Right. Well, yeah, so, but, but that this, statue wouldn't affect this. No, no, because this is this is the town owned land. Uh, but I mean, that's that's your question. Is I mean, there is, I, I think, this the coming up the legislature maybe some attempts to to change that so the towns could uh, be more strict on pesticide use for private owners. But that's not that's not what this is, and that's not um, even available. Point. Um, <clears throat> I, I hadn't seen this exact uh, number before. I mean, I, I did know that Adam had pointed out there's going to be some initial capital cost, but that's not a yearly cost. And uh, and the big cost would be a labor cost for weed whacking at, at, a, at a rather uh, low paying rate. Uh, there are some charts that show your initial cost is higher and then you come down over time. There's some graphs like that that we've seen. We didn't bring any of those. I, I, I have a question about this, inf this information that we just got. Um, uh, and forgive me if I am wrong about this, but the process of fertilizing is very different than the process of pesticide application, am I correct? Correct. Two separate things altogether. 
So what is the application of these numbers to the issue? Is it just the insect control well, well, and the insect spray? I think we have to address those okay. questions to Adam. Yeah. Okay, so why don't we let Dave complete his presentation. Well, the question then was... Then we'll have Adam make his presentation what this is going to cost. I was just thinking about what you asked, though, about what's the cost of, the, of this policy, right? Wasn't that the question? Yeah, but I think it's in fairness to David. I think that that, that question should be answered by okay. Adam. Yeah. That's fine. Okay. What happened at Beecher is we saved money over there because they eliminated a lot of insecticides that were cost, costing a lot of mm -hmm. money at that point. So they probably had several thousand dollars savings. So that I don't know what, what the savings in here is as far as in, insecticides right. and right. chemicals that were not being used. Would that, that would be a question to ask him. Okay. Um, the second part of the thing that I said that's been raised is, is what I've kind of said, the beauty of the playing fields uh, or the concern that, that somehow the fields would not uh, look um, as good as they now are. Uh, and, and I think there's a lot of debate on that. The pictures I think that you've seen would show that, that there's no significant dif difference. Uh, Interestingly, when we were at the Rec Commission uh, meeting the other night, John Adamovich, uh, who umpires a lot in Cheshire, said, gee, he's been there a lot and didn't realize that this was a field that didn't have pesticides on it. So I thought that was kind of an interesting view from somebody that had uh, you know, been regularly in, in the Cheshire fields. And, and they were the exact ones that these pictures are shown of. Um, this, this study also that shows from Cornell has <coughs> said that <coughs> many opponents uh, of this claim that organic management will put the fields at risk for disease and weed infestation. But the Cornell University study showed organically, um, chemically main maintained turf is more susceptible to disease because of low organic matter content and depleted soil microorganisms. So, uh, I mean, I don't think we know for sure. Adam, I know, is very uh, committed to trying to use organics if, if it works out. I think one of his concerns is that if there's a problem with the field, he doesn't want to be blamed for the fact that there's a spot there. And, and I can appreciate that. But I don't think that's going to be a major issue. And, and, and I know Adam's been going to many seminars uh, about using organics. So we're not talking about throwing somebody into this that doesn't know what they're doing. Hopefully that's correct, Adam. Yeah. Mr. Ciccolino, who's director of Park and Rec in Cheshire, said there was a lot of, people weren't sure at first, but they said there was a lot of very positive public feedback once it was in place. And they did it there because they were concerned about a higher than average cancer rate amongst children in Cheshire. So that was the thing that kind of got them going on it. And they've done it for at least six years. Has that changed in any I think cancer is a very long term. No, I understand thing, that. So but that I think the data would be hard to, to be able to be relied on. So it's eight years in Cheshire? Well, it was six years ago, it was about a year ago, so it's probably been seven years. What about Greenwich and Brantford? Brantford was 10, I believe. Brantford has been doing it for 10 years, and Greenwich is, I believe, six years. Are those the only three towns that have done it? No, um, other towns and other Manchester and Watertown. As of a year ago, Manchester and Watertown were uh, considering it. Um, Mrs. Shaw had sent me a note saying they were uh, moving from conventional organic turf management. I haven't had time in all this research to find out if there are, in fact, any new ones. Um. Um, so now I'm going to turn a, a bit to the meeting with the uh, Recreation Commission a, a couple of weeks ago, and and we had a, a, a pretty good discussion. Mr. Growth here was there, I think, and <coughs> um, and I th I think a couple of things. First of all, is I'm not sure what final authority that they have on this. In fact, as, as Stan said, who's back here, I think now that that really wasn't something. I mean, they don't do the fields; they just do the rec commission. So. I think it was more an advisory, but their ultimate conclusion was to, to say, let's do two fields, which they said to do center field and West River, 
and and do it for two years and and see what happens. Uh, in all fairness, um, the I think those two fields, first of all, the ones that now have the least pesticide usage on them, so it's not sure it's a very fair way of doing it. But with all due respect, I, I don't think that this is the time to start going slow on something like this. And, and I think about the safety issues, and, and my son's been an umpire, and umpired a number of the Woodbridge fields, and it's very clear that there's some immediate safety issues of, of taken very seriously. Like, the helmets and the bats have to be certified and stamped, and the umpire has to look and make sure that they meet this qualification, or that's not safe enough. Uh, when, when there's a lightning, uh, you can't play for at least a half hour after there's lightning in the air that you don't see any more lightning because the aluminum bats. Obviously, that can be a serious risk, but probably not all that likely that you're actually going to have lightning hit a, a bat. And, and yet, we have these kids playing out in those fields uh, with these pesticides that are there all the time that we know do cause problems in a significant number of kids. But we don't seem to be that worried about it because we're doing a kind of a crisis management. You know, if somebody gets struck by lightning, you say, oh, boy, we should have avoided that. But we have them out there playing, and you can't say the next day, gee, this kid got cancer because he was out in that field. I mean, I just think it's, it's so clear that we're causing harm. These kids are not allowed to be exposed to these uh, pesticides in, in their grade schools that they're going to. Why would we want to keep doing it? And if there's some awful thing that happens to the fields, which I quite sure wouldn't, uh, Mr. Sheehy's got a power under this policy to say, okay, you can go out there and do something. Uh, I just think people are afraid to take this step, and we need to take it. And, and we need to stop saying half a loaf, test it out. I mean, I'm not one that's opposed to compromise and trying to think, but, but I just think this has been kind of going on too long. And we've We've got the numbers. The cost, I don't think, is at all prohibitive. I know that's one thing that everyone's very concerned about. But when you think about what it is that we're doing, not only to the kids but to other people, the cost is not that major an issue. When we're talking about the beauty of the fields, I think you're going to find those are just fine. So I would hope, and I certainly will try to answer any questions, or Jenny and Adam, I'm sure some rec people will talk about it. But this is something I think we need to do, and we need to do it and, and send a message that we're serious about this. So, so the other two fields that are not, is it just two other fields that are not included in the recreation motion? That would be a and Cornell right. and the and Leggy, is that what that would be? Yeah. yeah. Okay. And, and I think the one acorn field is the most seriously uh, pesticide. Okay. That's a word. Okay. <laughs> it is now. Treated. Uh, treated, okay. <laughs> so any questions of what they were presenting? Do you know anything about um, Cheshire, Greenwich, and Brantford, the use of these fields? I don't know I don't know the answer to this, but my uh, sense is that we don't have enough fields for the use that are requested. People are being turned away sometimes and so our fields are getting so heavily used that um, does that mean they don't, they're not going to stand up as well if they're not being treated? And it, it's all that much more serious if we lose a field for a season. I, I, I couldn't tell you the, the usage of the fields and those by how many kids. I mean, I mean, Cheshire has a lot of fields, so I imagine if they want to, they could rest the field. Well, they're very active, but they seem like they're using all of them, too. Well, they, um, the Cheshire has baseball fields. Most of them are by, well, they're both on Main Street, some right across from the high school, and then some farther up by the police station. Then a lot of their soccer fields are off somewhere else that I never knew about before. They, uh, they have six ball fields, I believe, at least from my note, and nine fields for soccer that are, a lot of people are using those. But as the baseball, uh, I'm not sure that they have that many more fields, and I six assume that Cheshire is substantially this. larger than Woodbridge. Uh, three here and three there. And we have three at Cheshire Park. Cheshire, and those ones are three that yeah. we saw. Yeah. Cheshire has a population of about 20,000, is that right? Something I think that it's 
probably at least twice what would be. I mean, right. Mr. Chigolino is happy to talk to anyone. In fact, all three of the people I spoke with are very positive about having people come out and see them, and look, talk with them, or whatever. Um, well, I can only speak for the soccer fields. So there is Quinnipiac. They have a, it's called the Quinnipiac mm -hmm. Park, Nine I guess fields, it is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They've got a lot of soccer fields back there, and they're very heavily used, and they're very beat up. But these and are pictures. Uh, no, I understand that. They're taken in the spring. With soccer is spring. It's all year, basically. But just to say that they're very heavily used. So um, you're always waiting. There are always kids out there, and that could be part of the reason why they're the way they are. But that's, uh, you know, I'm, I'm uh, not against it. And I, I don't want you to think that that's it. My kids played on the Woodbridge Fields. Woodbridge Fields are beautiful. Um, and uh, like I said, they, their whole lives they've spent playing on those fields. Not to any detriment that I could tell to this point. Uh, who knows, 10 years from now. But so from that perspective, I, I think it's a good idea. And I think uh, Adam's been before this uh, board to discuss pesticide use. And from what I understand, and he'll tell us that when he comes up, is. From what I understand, he's using the lowest level that he possibly can. <coughs> so as a town, we're already taking steps to make sure that we're not overly uh, treating our fields. And he does a great job with the fields. We get compliments from um, athletes and coaches from all around the state and the region on the condition of our baseball fields and on the condition of the soccer fields over at Pease Road. So, uh, you know, and then uh, again, the West River fields are very heavily used during the soccer season and during the baseball season. So. They also take a beating. Uh, my concern is the cost, and it's, it's an expensive proposition. And um, like Susan had said, I know that um, some of these numbers may be, uh, we're already spending some of this money. I don't know if this is all for going organic or not, but you know, Adam will explain that to us. But as I said earlier, the concern is, you know, this initial, the minutes from rec. <coughs> Uh, said 30,000 and this is to 22.8 but it's still a lot of money and and today we've got a lot of other competing interests and so my biggest concern is the cost I understand your concern that you don't want to wait and it's something that but I think as a country and as a state and as a town over the years we have heeded uh, Rachel Carlson's uh, message and a lot of uh, pesticides are no longer used they're illegal so I think as a as a society we're changing so um, that's my biggest concern is the cost if if the board is uh, convinced that this is the way to go and Adam is convinced this is the way to go and recreations is signed off on it I'm not going to stand in the way but my biggest concern today is the cost okay any other comments uh, or questions for I, Virginia? I have a comment yeah, yes. um, I think it's a wonderful idea and um, I agree with you that we shouldn't just do, as long as I, I do want to hear numbers about the cost, I'm also worried about the money, but I'm very concerned about, our, I think we, we as a town should be leaders in this field and go along with the other. These are spiffy towns that have done it already, and um, I think it's important that Woodbridge uh, do this. I have a couple questions about the policy, but that can be done at another time. There are minor things, and we can talk about that. I'm not going to waste time now. but. Um, I, I do think that it's important for us to do it and do it the right way. And if the cost is, we'll hear about it, I guess, and how bad it's going to be. But um, I think it's well worth the money to spend it on it and do it all of them and not just two. Uh, but it looks like Center, by the way, Center's this recreation letter. Center says there's, it says Robert Hill, hi, Rob, hi, <laughs> Bob, uh, made a motion to test the no pesticide policy at the West River and Center road fields for two years? That's more than two fields, isn't it? I think the property, was two, two Okay, complex. so it's, that's a, that's a lot of fields, right? And so the only ones that you weren't going to do were Acorn Hill, is that? You didn't want to do Acorn Hill? Oh, yeah, we'll, we'll get them, Why don't it, yeah, we'll just we'll direct our questions here to the Snyders, then we'll go to the All right. recreation, okay? I'm sorry. Yeah. I just have I would think there'd yeah, be some offsets for the merit in different that are not going to be needed to be used. Exactly. So, right. I don't know if this budget gets to the... Yeah, I just want to make an initial comment as well. Um, I applaud your efforts. And this is, I'm not concerned about the cost. I'm curious about the cost. Um, I want to know what it is. But I, it, it's hard for me to imagine that continued use of these pesticides is worth any amount of money. 
Um, so I do want to know what it is, and of course we're going to have responsible on that, but I applaud your efforts. This is really, really important, and I think Woodward should be a leader in this. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So it's really important work. Any other questions or comments for the Schneiders? If not, Stan Gadanski is here, who's the chair of the uh, Recreation Commission, and we have a copy of your minutes where you, you passed a, a motion unanimously limiting this uh, non-pesticide use to two complexes. And uh, is, is there anything further you want to add to that, or we could get up and make some comments if you like us to. If, 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 sure, fine. ago that we'd be in, into this part of the discussion but it's led to it's funny it trips on a number of different things we've talked on um, when um, the Recreation Commission certainly doesn't want to come off as being um, and we're concerned about uh, cancer with children and, and that's certainly we want to address it um, as um, Dr. Snyder and uh, his wife came and presented to the Recreation Commission. Uh, I mean, initially when it came to us, it came to us in a, that to have it on our agenda, and uh, I think it was in January. And um, as we began to get into it, we started learning a little more about it, talking to different people in town about what's involved with uh, this process and, and what takes place. Um, and as we, you know, Adam came to the meeting and presented you know, it, um, you know his issues he's going to deal with and being held accountable for keeping the fields in, in good condition, that type of thing. Um, I think at whatever it's it, when we passed the motion to test it on two fields, um, and I know we did have some kind of discussion. Sites. Two sites. Two sites. We had some discussion back and forth, all or nothing, and that kind of thing. I guess part of what our thinking was, and Stan, you can correct me, was as we head into this and begin to start having Adam transition with the overseeders, uh, the different types of uh, natural uh, organic uh, fertilizers that he would use and the additional labor that he would use, that I'm going to guess that there's going to be some learning that's going to take place in caring for the fields. And if during that period of that two-year time, um, we happen to start losing some fields, uh, that'd be a major issue because right at that same meeting that the Snyders attended, and unfortunately we didn't get them on the agenda until about 30 minutes after we had scheduled them, was our annual, we, we have two times a year where field requests are made. And at that same meeting, we had to reject rugby, we had to reject lacrosse asking for more fields, we had to reject a soccer group because we just don't have the fields for them. And a concern we, that came up was with the amount of use that's taken place, what would happen and what happens once with this type of treatment, what would happen to the fields? And, you know, when the Cheshire example was put on the table, experience is similar to Tom's. I've been down to the Cheshire fields. They have a lot more fields than, than we have. Uh, I know when my kids have been down there for games, they're, yeah, they're heavily used, but quite often on the uh, uh, fields, and probably most people don't know about the Quinnipiac uh, uh, fields, um, there's a surplus there. Now, what I don't know about those fields is whether or not there's irrigation, because that does have an impact on how well they're kept. But uh, those fields are not nearly as well kept or in as good a shape as our fields. Now, it's more than just beauty. Apart from any pesticides. Apart from any pesticides. The discussion really, at least from uh, where I sit, is less beauty, and it's really, I think there's some kind of logic that take, has taken place from a state level why there's no pesticide or there are pesticides on the high school fields. Now, obviously that needs to be addressed too. As the fields become sparser with coverage of turf and the children are older and, and bigger, as they land on the field, now you have other issues you're dealing with, with concussions and injuries and that type of thing. So there is still a safety issue for you to deal with on that end of it. So. The issue about maintaining the fields and having them looking pristine and beauty, it, 
really doesn't relate to the, the, the aesthetics. It has to do with the safety again of, of the children. So as we waded into this discussion, um, we initially were only going to go with one field, uh, one location, which was West River. And then we realized in the discussion that there's no irrigation down on West River, so that wouldn't be a fair test. Uh, so we said, let's do it on two fields, and if it's going well, maybe we can move more quickly. Uh, I think the worst place for us to be is within a two-year period or a year out, that all of a sudden we have a huge problem on all the fields, and we come back to the town. And certainly, you know, we know from a recreation standpoint, and certainly from a baseball league standpoint, we know about funds available to build fields and replace fields at this point. So if we had to come back to the Board of Selectmen and say we just lost the fields over at Pease Road or whatever, I don't think the town's going to be in line for replacing all the turf somewhere uh, quickly. So, and you know, our position isn't that we're against this, we're, we're in favor, but what we're saying is there needs to be, and we've heard this here at, this, at these meetings here, there needs to be a plan. There needs to be a plan moving this along and not just a knee jerk, do it, and all of a sudden we have a problem that we're going to deal with. So I just made a couple other notes here in, in looking at this. Uh, we approved the two fields contingent on Adam getting the appropriate budget to be able to do what he needs on the fields. Just recognize as he begins that process, and I think we heard the number 30,000, what if he starts into it in the first year, two years into it, we, he finds he needs more materials or he needs more overseers or he needs more help. If we're committed to this, we need to sit here and say, okay, if he needs more, we have to give it to him. And I know it's kind of hard to say we're going to write a blind check, and that's part of the two-year test. How much does the town want to absorb of this uh, as you go along? Um, Dr. Rick Cheshire talked to uh, the budget. Um, yeah, I think those were really the key points that we can. We're in favor of it, but we're in favor of a logical approach moving forward with, with it. Let's start it at the two fields we're talking about. Let's monitor it. Let's see where we're going. And if quickly we can move to the, to the other fields, fine. But I think that there's a learning process here that Adam and his group will need to uh, work through uh, to make sure it works. If, so those were standing. That's, that's was, about it. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. What was the thinking in picking those two fields? Uh, part of the thinking, um, first of all, those two facilities happen to be the happen to be the facilities that the youngest children play on. West River, you've got the first and second grade soccer players, and most of your younger baseball players have played down there. So, if the concern, and you know, who knows, you know, is the question that was asked before was, you know, for instance, Cheshire's had done their situation for seven or eight years, and they've had high cancer rates with younger children. Well, if those children have been on those fields for eight years, what do we know about 11 and 12 year olds? A lot of this data is, is very difficult to, to really know, but if you're at West River and you know kids in first and second grade and they jokingly say you're picking daisies, well, guess what? You know, you certainly don't want pesticides in fields when the youngest kids were, were more apt to, to do that. So that's really the, um, the major reason that we picked uh, those. Do we fields. know if any of these towns, Brantford, Greenwich, or uh, Cheshire, phased in their non-pesticide use? No, no, I, you know, it's funny because the, the day after um, uh, Ginny and uh, Dr. Snyder attended uh, our meeting, I was at a district meeting in Hamden, a uh, district meeting for uh, soccer, and uh, I was hoping to run into the Cheshire guy and he wasn't there that night, so I didn't have that opportunity. We but find I will have that opportunity in the future. I, I do speak to uh, uh, Steve Barardi from uh, uh, periodically when I see him at the meetings. Thank just, you. Just an additional yep. point. I think it has to be recognized that Adam is going to need some funds for over, for equipment, material, and labor, and it has to be a commitment that it's not going to be nickel and dime. It, it, it's, he's going to conduct this process on those fields. He's got to be assured that he will get what he needs. Okay. So, Adam, you're up. <laughs> Get to the bat. Uh -oh. Should have never made the field so nice. <laughs> <laughs> so we have your uh, memo of 
uh, February 7 at a, yeah. about it, the uh, Parks Department current fertilization budget mm -hmm. and proposed organic fer fertilization program. So maybe if you just run run us through that. That uh, current fertilization budget, that fertilizer is not just fertilizer alone, it's fer fertilizer and pesticide mixed together. Uh -huh. It's not just fertilizer alone. Okay. When you go <clears throat> to 9,000, that's six plus nine. Uh, just to let you know that a, one bag of fertilizer, organic fertilizer, costs 35 to $38. A regular bag of fertilizer that I buy is like $21. Just fertilizer, no pesticides. So there's an increase right there. And also, <clears throat> it takes approximately two bags of organic fertilizer to equal one bag of synthetic fertilizer. For coverage purposes? Exactly. So that organic fertilizer bag, let's say, covers just say 5,000 square feet. So now you need two bags because the regular fertilizer only covers 10,000 square feet. So that's where the cost goes up. Um, no, seed, this would be for all the fields in the town. It would. Budget. Okay, it would. Mm -hmm. uh, seed, lime, and weed control is pretty basic. Weed control is, is Roundup. Um, along all the fencing, the ball field clay, the cemetery stones, the headstones. Um, if you eliminate that, that means I've got to do it by hand. And I don't really do it by hand now. I just, I mean, Roundup's nice, but it's not good for the environment. But I, I spray it, and nobody's weed whacking it. But now I'm going to have to weed whack it. And also weed all the flower beds in town, uh, weed whack all the headstones, there's not there's not an organic <clears throat> equivalent to Roundup right now. Everyone always says there's vinegar. I guess it's been taken off the market because now it's EPA rated. It's 22% in the in the um, white vinegar. Now they've taken it off the market. You can't use it, so that's gone. So there's nothing out there organically that could equal Roundup. <clears throat> So right there, just the just the labor alone, that person's going to be on his hands and knees and weed whacking. We're, we've never done that before. So that's where the cost comes. I'm going to need a body to do that. Um, insect control. Insect control on the proposed, that's a nematode, a microscopic worm that you spray, water it in, and it gets in the, the grub and kills it instead of a pesticide. Um, it's relatively new. Not everybody's using it. It's kind of new. You have to have a sprayer for it. I can't. Uh, I can't put it down. I got a you know a broadcast spreader. I have to put it down in a liquid and then immediately water it in. Um, what's that? Right. There's a storage problem. All the stuff I need a gray trailer to store the, the sprayer, the overseeder, the trailer, the tractor. I've. Uh, we already have a tractor. Um, Adam, can I interrupt for a second? Sure. After the nematode yep. kills the grub, yep. are birds still interested in that dead grub? Yeah, it wouldn't matter. It wouldn't affect them. Yeah. No, 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 no. I'm, not, I'm, I'm wondering about the birds picking apart the turf to get the dead grubs. Yeah, that's a problem, but mostly on a golf course is on a shortly cut turf. You'll see damage from um, crows or skunks. You possibly will see it, but you got to make sure timing is critical. On when, the, when a grub lays an egg and hatches, it's early August. If you mix miss that window and they become an adult, it's very difficult to control, and it'll to ravage the turf. Turf, and then you will have a problem of a skunk coming in. It'll be like a rototiller, literally like a rototiller. And we had that. I had that problem. I didn't use pesticides. At a leggy one year, so I'm not using them. See what happens. And we had grubs on one of the back fields. I was like, I walked out there. I was like, holy moly! It looked like someone rototilled it. So I had to put down a pesticide um, to eliminate that. Um, even though the skunks kept on digging them up and eating them, um, I didn't like it. I don't like doing it. I don't. I don't like pesticides. I think this is a great idea. Um, yes, there's some costs involved, but I've got to fine tune it, and I feel like it'll come down somewhat. Um, organics will, will fortify the soil, make it healthier for turf to grow. Um, the biggest problem we have is, is a soccer field. In the middle of the soccer field, it gets beat up. 
that's the problem areas with the, cl the cloth, the cross plays. Those are the areas where you need, you got to overseed it continually, continually, continually. Almost every week, you got to put a little bit of seed in that playing area to make sure that seed comes up. Um, and it's got to go for nine months. You got to put that down almost every week, just a little bit of ryegrass seeds, just to hopefully get grass growing up in those but areas. You're doing that now anyway. Very minimally. Very minimally. And, and are you saying that you're going to be doing more of that now? Yeah. And, 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 and that's because. I don't have insecticides. Now, I don't know about that nematode. I'm skeptical about that. Everybody is. I mean, I sat in a class today in Rhode Island. There'd be 2,000 people in there talking about organic pesticides and, and products and stuff. And of course, people are raising their hands and asking about nematodes. You know? Are you familiar with um, compost tea? Have you done I am, and I'm not a fan of it. Because? A lot of labor intensive. I don't think it's great results. I think it's uh, every every superintendent or every ground superintendent has their own little you know way of doing things. Uh -huh. It's pretty basic. There's pretty basic stuff. Look at the guy in Brantford who puts down leaf compost. That's his key. He loves leaf compost. He has access to <laughs> ground leaf compost and he top presses the fields with it. Um, do I believe in it? I don't know. You know. I mow the leaves around the field. I don't see the difference in the grass with the leaves that I chop up. You know, there was a very lengthy story on NPR today about the fact that the Everglades are now infested with Burmese pythons. Mm -hmm. So just for perspective here on what our problem is, <laughs> okay, you know, I think we're doing all right. Not just the snakes. That there's trees yeah. that are yeah. taking over yeah. the Everglades, yeah. too. So, I mean, a little perspective here. What, whatever you get from this, I. I I just wanted to tell you that this is a good thing. You know, I, <clears throat> I don't know if you know, I, I, I've been putting down insecticide very limited amounts, just enough to get by. I mean, if you wanted a spectacular baseball field, I could do that if it's going to cost you. Um, one year, I used to be tons of bees at West River going for the white clover. And all of a sudden, I didn't see the bees. And then the next year, I didn't see the bees that much at all. And then I was concerned. I mean, I was literally mowing, you know, stopping for a bumblebee and waiting, you know, just touching them and hope he flies off. You know, because literally I could kill, a, you know, a thousand bumblebees and one time I cut that field and all of a sudden the bumblebees were disappearing. And uh, it's, you don't see bumblebees down there anymore. And I don't like it. Right, that's a bad thing. That's a bad thing. And when you don't see that, you know, you start to really worry. And I'm worried. And I, don't, and I have, been, have not been applying very limited amounts down there. Very limited amounts. I, I love Roundup. It makes, it makes my life easy. You know, I spray it and end the story, and I don't have to worry about sending the guy out there with weed whacker, you know. So, but it's a good thing. Initially, you bite the bullet, and these years goes down the line. I'll fine-tune this, and it'll come down. And that's, that's, that's it in a nutshell really is. I mean, it's pretty basic stuff here, in my eyes. I don't know what you guys, you know. I mean, I've been doing this since I've been 14 years old, being around a golf course, working on a golf course, and I'm still doing it. So um, it looks easy to me. It is basic. This is basic turf grass it, to me. And uh, there's no uh, fluff in this at all, zero fluff. So in your present budget, you have seventy-five hundred dollars for yep. current fertilization. Yep. If we were to go to this plan, it would that would increase to twenty-five thousand five hundred, as an estimate. As an estimate, right? That's correct. The labor of fourteen thousand is increased the labor. It is. Which is why you don't have the labor of that. So it's it is. And right now, I I don't have guys weed whacking or pulling weeds and like in say the new firehouse, with all that mulch around the little pool there. You got to get down on your hands and knees now and weed that. That would break most of your hair. <laughs> and I'm serious. I'm from the youngest person. It would. So that's what you got to do. You're gonna have to do that. And not you don't have to do that a lot. Weeds don't rest. You pull them. The roots still on the ground. One week later, boop, here it comes again. You know. So there's that's a lot of labor. You know. You have a baseball field with clay. I didn't apply Roundup down in West River by the tennis courts down there. I don't know if you saw that baseball field. It looked like it was grassed in. 
So you've got to rototill that and you've got to edge that field. If you want a nice baseball field like you guys go to Acorn with your children, that's the labor involved. Someone's got to do that. And I don't usually do that because I spray Roundup on it. Now you've got to do that by hand. You've got to get out there with an edger and start edging, flip it, rake it out, put it in a bucket, get rid of it, and go to the next field. Now, if you guys don't want that, those fields are not going to look like they do now. And this equipment, this is all new equipment, is it? Adam? It is. Yeah. Is there I any need possibility of leasing this equipment, or is that? Uh, an overseer, no way. People don't want to. That, that's a, we, when I first got hired, we, we did that. Now it's tough to find an overseer that's not beat up. You know, you, it's, it's a lot, it's a heavy use wear and tear piece of equipment. And you're, you're tearing into the turf with, uh, you know, there's rocks underneath it. It's really, there's gonna be a little maintenance to this. It's gonna go up a little bit. But uh, the trailer, I've gotta store it. The sprayer, I've gotta have. Only thing I can say about the sprayer, sprayer we could try um, to hire, there are people out there who will spray it for us. Let's try it. See if it works instead of buying the sprayer. I mean, I know it's only $4,800, but let's do that the first year or two. Let's hire somebody. Let's spray it. Let's see if it works. And if it doesn't work, move on. And if it does work, maybe think about it in a couple of years, three, two, three years, maybe purchasing a sprayer. Okay, any further comments or questions about that? Adam, what's your opinion of if we were to do this to, to doing it with the two fields is the theory here that if you lose a field I will lose a field so what do you what's your feeling on two fields versus everything in one um I mean you could try that it's up to you guys I mean it's each field is different in many ways different soil structure different sunlight different wind it's all kinds of things involved in it. Every field has its own life to it. So you've got to treat it differently. You've got to cut it at different times. So, yeah, let's let's try it. If you don't want to, let's do it all. But, I mean, initially, I don't think it's that much money t for the safety of the people, of the children. That's where it comes down to. I Like I said, the bees. I'm still spraying that stuff or putting it up at Acorn. So is it fair to say that more pesticides used on acorn than there is on west river or Def, center yes yes center no center's the same as center, acorn okay yeah west river or is that a lady oh yeah yeah everything's equal except west river because i'm afraid of uh there's a lot of people down there and i'm afraid of the what i'm what i'm seeing about the bees i don't like that you know? there's a problem there because you apply a pesticide it's in the ground it's in the plant it's absorbed systemically in the plant the flower of a white clover is blossom, bee comes along, sucks, sucks the nectar out of it. That's not good. So, so it's, what, po it's poisoning the bee. So what you're saying to us, you're recommending that your budget be amended to include these numbers if we uh, definitely. adopt this policy. Right. We, we can definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Could okay. I add one thing for yeah. discussion? Uh, last night I was at a coupon meeting as their liaison. Um, so they actually talking about this topic, they passed a motion and asked us, the BOS, to not act on this just so they have an opportunity um, if, we want, if we wanted to push some of it back to them to get an opinion. Um, I don't know if there's, there's a lot of publicly owned property, so I don't know if there's repercussions with some of the publicly owned property that we're not thinking of. But I just want to make you aware of what what they had done. Keep in mind that in the seminar today, I think less than three months, there could be a decision made from the state where it, Connecticut is banned of all use of pesticides on all fields, everywhere, across the state. So that in less than three months. That would be a, a regulation, or that'd be a state law. Okay. Something the General law. Assembly would pass, or maybe you don't know. Or, I'm not sure. Yeah, okay, but it would. Like it is for K through eight. I see. Yeah, extend it. Through extend K through, through twelve. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. And it, I mean, just to let you know, it's coming. At homeowners. It's going to happen. Yeah. I guarantee. Because yeah. everybody. I'm meeting up. I met in Rhode Island. It's turf grass. It's superintendents, golf course superintendents, and private. You know, you know, landscapers. 
It's like everybody from the entire Northeast is there. And the whole vibe of the whole entire seminars that are going on is organic. That's what's happening. And every time for the past eight years, that's everyone's talking about. It's coming, it's coming, and it's coming. And we have state representatives from DEEP saying it's coming. It's happening. So Can I ask Greg a question? Sure. About, did yeah. they say specifically, Greg, what exactly? And did they have concerns about this policy, or they uh, wanted to? S I got the sense they didn't know enough about it. Um, I don't know. I think they just uh, wanted to have the ability to have input on it. Uh huh. Okay. What group are you talking about? Uh, Commission on Public Women Owned Properties. I'm a liaison, and I was at their meeting last night. Is that a town commission? Yes. yes. It's commission on the use of publicly owned yeah. properties. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, it's slightly different than the commission on, on the maintenance. Well, the ultimate you know, the decision is ours. Yeah. Right. Right. So. Um, and I'm not. That's, that doesn't yeah. mean any disrespect to them. I'm just trying to think of what their what their thoughts would be. Mm -hmm. Well, considering they haven't met in years and they're meeting now, and it's, that was their, right? That was their uh, their motion, I guess. Their they had two, but I, yeah, I'm just <coughs> expressing to you what happened at the meeting. Well, uh, we're, we're going to meet again on March 7th. That's it. March 6th. 6th. Six, um, excuse me. March 6th. Is your part of it? <laughs> so, and we may be meeting next Wednesday night. Right. So, uh, what's your pleasure? We want to await receipt of whatever comments they may have. Well, they're not going to meet again before next Wednesday. Oh, I thought they'd taken a position that, that oh, you're just no. not asking us not to act, but not, not saying anything Without them weighing in, but that could be another, what, when's the next meeting in a month? Mm -hmm. Do they meet I monthly? I think they're meeting monthly now. I don't know. Well, I think we ought to put this in the budget, budgetary process, and uh, at some juncture, uh, they can come and address that issue when we have a further discussion about the budget. Right. So if we're going to talk about putting this in the budget, Tony, where would this come from? Uh, we would just increase it in the budget on the 23rd. And you make your recommendations to the Board of Finance. February 23rd. February 23rd. That would be your opportunity to increase his lines for capital and for mm -hmm. operating by the amounts here. Basically. So Adam would present that to finance? No, what happens is he present, he's presented it to you. To the board of select. We'll just meet so that then night. you meet decide. and we'll decide whether you want to add it or you know. Right. And at that meeting, we can invite the publicly owned properties committee if they want to have any input into it. Yeah, the budget. Okay. So uh, hold that's on a, a second. That's a good uh, idea. All right. So uh, do we need to take some formal action here tonight? <coughs> we have a motion to do that. Oh, I think you can just bring it up. We can just bring it up at the, the, uh, the 23rd? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Maria? Well, I just wanted to uh, um. check in because um, we are also concerned, the Woodbridge Conservation Commission is also very concerned about uh, pesticide. I love these people for um, looking into town-owned properties. But in eventually, um, you know, it affects water. The pesticide affects water, and we are a town that is... Um, that uses well water um, so much, so pesticides get into these things, and um, he's right. There is a lot of movement um, in the state level to do away with the preemption law, and uh, so we might as well be prepared. And uh, I can also speak to health because I brought up a child here yeah. who <laughs> had cancer, who. You know, I bought this property in Woodbridge because he could get out and he used it and he had bone cancer. I mean, you know, there's so many relationships to these things and we want to affect generations to come. We have to act now. So that's all I Okay. So what we'll do then, we'll put this on the agenda for the February, February 23rd budget uh, recommendations and uh, we'll invite you uh, Adam to make this again this presentation about increasing your budget if the public owned properties commission has any input they won't have any input into this they can appear and then we'll act on it that night okay sounds good
that, is that everyone agree? fine with that? Okay. Mm -hmm. I, I just have one thing about yep. the policy. Um, I would just like to go, maybe I could go over with Jerry a couple of things, make sure my, my comments about, I read it over and I have just a couple minor things that okay. I wanted sure. to tweak in terms yep. of the policy. We can do that. But we can do that. We I think this is real good. good. I think it's excellent. And All right. I like well, thank your you confidence. all for your input. And Adam's not going to let those feels die. I think great. <laughs> good confidence. I like that. <laughs> Good job. Thank okay. you. Yeah. Okay. The next item on our agenda is the Masaro Farm update. And Jason Morrill is here. Uh, <laughs> he's been here uh, waiting patiently. All right. <laughs> Evening, everybody. Good. I come with news from the farm. It's been a while since I've been before the board, so I'm going to catch everybody up on what's been going on. Um, 2012. I think it's going to be the year for our dairy barn finally. We've once again applied for a grant from the state to help fund dairy barn renovations. Um, we're waiting to hear a response from that. Apparently, there's budget issues at the state, as many may know. Um, we're waiting to hear the news coming down from up high. Um, but regardless of whether we get the grant or not, we will move forward with dairy barn renovations this year. Um, on top of the dairy barn right now, as many have seen, there are solar panels. The switch has finally been flipped and we're generating electricity from the sun now. Uh, I think we'll have a, a grand unveiling later this year, maybe sometime around the Earth Day or so. Um, it's a five kilowatt array um, and whenever the sun's shining, we're generating electricity up there. Staying on the topic of the dairy barn, we uh, were approached by the Connecticut Trust for Historic Preservation. Uh, the dairy barn is being nominated to be added to the State Register of Historic Places specifically focused on agricultural buildings. Um, I was spoke with Charlotte Hitchcock up at the state, and a quote from her was, inclusion on the state register is an honorary designation and contributes to the documenting in the, of the history of our state. Um, she, also <laughs> she also confirmed that being on this list does not limit our ability to renovate the dairy barn for the purposes that we intend. Um, obviously, by the name, it was a dairy barn. Uh, being an organic vegetable farm, we're not using it for dairy anymore. Um, so the concern from our board was, can we not do what we're going to do with it? Uh, no, uh, that's fine. They actually applaud the fact that the barn was even saved uh, and renovated to the point where it is today. The capital campaign that we started last year was a success. We set out to raise $150,000, and over the course of it, we actually did. We met our goal. And throughout the fundraising, we were continuing improving the farm. We put up fencing, a hoop house, there were other infrastructure improvements and repairs necessary, and obviously the money that from that capital campaign is going towards the dairy barn renovations so that we can definitely move ahead regardless of whether the grant comes through or not. Um, on a different note, our outreach and partnership coordinator, you had all met Melissa last year. She was a fantastic asset. She did some great work for the farm. Um, we have met with our hiring committee, and the board had a different direction heading than what her interests were lying. Um, the board wanted to focus heavily on education and event outreach and partnership coordination and additional fundraising through foundations um, and also you know, keeping up PR and website updates. Um, we're, we, we let Melissa go because her interest didn't lie heavily in the outreach of events and fundraising. Even though she did a fantastic job on the PR and the website, she got her newsletter always running, uh, reaching out to the papers and whatnot. Um, so we will be looking for a replacement for her. We're going to be evaluating our options over the next few months. And the hope is that we'll find somebody that we can grow into a full-time CEO type position we have two more years on the grant from the Community Foundation from Greater New Haven to help fund this position, but we're also looking for funds from other sources, whether it's other foundations, um, there's an opportunity from uh, the Valley uh, for funding tied in with the Community Foundation to help fund a position such as this. So we're, we're once again moving ahead with the, the job hunt. Uh, CSA sales, very much like last year, going strong, there are still shares available for both summer and fall. Uh, as a reminder, we anticipate them to sell out, so make sure you sign up. The summer shares are $550 for 18 weeks, and the fall shares are $100 for four weeks. 
And the last bit of news I want to put out there is our annual meeting for the Masaro Community Farm is coming up. It's going to be held on Sunday, March 11th at 1.30, just next door here at the Parish House of the First, First Church of Christ. So hope to see everybody there. The public is welcome. Um, it's a great time. There'll be little finger foods, and you'll get a power presentation from me and hear about everything that's been going on at the farm. So it's a quick rundown. Very good. I'm open to any questions you might have. Just, just a quick one, Jason. Yeah. Did, maybe you said it. What, what, do, what does the board want to use the dairy farm for? Uh, the dairy barn right now is on the interior. It's completely gutted. Right. Um, the upstairs area <coughs> is permitted for a very small impact, so less than 50 people. Um, and it's an area that, um, for example, we're going to have a beekeeping workshop. Um, it's limited to 20 people, and the upstairs of the barn is good for setting up some sawhorses and showing how to assemble beehives. So it's a nice open area, um, and you don't need to worry about dropping a hammer on the floor and, oh my god, I dented it. Uh, the downstairs is going to be used for produce distribution. Okay. Uh, it'll also have a bathroom and an office for the farm manager and, the, and his assistants as well. Uh, and we've, we've kept some of the uh, milk stanchions down there and the manure buckets. We want to honor the Masaros down there, so we'll have some history on the wall as well. Any other questions or comments? Just a quick question. Yeah. Is any of that electricity <coughs> being used? Uh, at, during the winter, obviously, it's not operating. The, the farm is, you know, really in the downtime. Um, but the way that it works is we sort of bank the credits so that in the summer, when we're running the cooler, we're running the irrigation from the well, we're running the greenhouse fans, um, it'll credit down what we've banked up. So at the end of the year, they compare what we produced with what we used. And our anticipation is that we're going to be generating more than what we'll be using. So the farm will be fully run by the sun. <laughs> Thank you, Jason. All right. Very good. Thank Thanks, everybody. Thanks. Okay. The next item is the Woodbridge Animal Control. We're going to continue that till next month for a report from uh, the police department. Uh, it's now a 10 of 7. Uh, Public comments were to be at seven. Is anyone eight. here? For ten of eight. Excuse me. Ten of eight. <laughs> Central standard. I'm glad you had uh, a good time. <laughs> <laughs> Is there any member of the public here would like to make any comments? Yes, ma'am. My name is Maria King. I'm chair of Woodbridge Conservation. Good evening. Um, I'm here to inform the board of a resolution passed by the Conservation Commission as it, at its last meeting on June, January 19, 2012. The resolution reads, um, resolved that the Woodbridge Conservation Commission report, uh, supports the position taken by Dr. Robert Gregg in his letter of January 16, 2012 to the first selectman, Ed Sheehy, that the Board of Selectmen work out the terms of a conservation easement on the land owned by the town of Woodbridge at the Country Club of Woodbridge before engaging in an appraisal of the value of the property and suggest that this be done following consultation with the land trust. Uh, uh, tonight, I would like to request that um, the Woodbridge Conservation be Commission be included in defining the conservation easement as well. Um, as this is part of our mandate. Overall, I think that we need to, to institute a process to achieve our goals for the conservation, uh, for the country club, because, for the country club, because of the significant impact on conservation, open space, and preservation, our commission should be part of the process. Thank you for listening. Maria, yeah. I have one question. On your uh, December 15th agenda, you had the Woodbridge Conservation Commission and pesticide bill. Mm -hmm. Is there anything you, oh, anything about you have pesticide. to add about the pesticide bill that you know of since we were talking about that time? Well, uh, like I told you, we're, uh, we're concerned about pesticides because of how it affects na the natural resource of water, which is a big deal in our town. Um, we would like the town to sign up to this preemption pre law, which doesn't say we need to be organic. It doesn't say that we don't need pesticides. What it says is that we should um, sign up to the fact that um, 
Woodbridge is interested in having, in, in, in going back to the original law, uh, for the intent of the law, so that towns can have the right um, to, to, pro to do their own thing with regards to pesticides and not just be restricted by state law. So we can do more or uh, comply less, but we should have the towns, municipalities should have a right to decide how they will manage their pesticides besides what the state asks them to do. Yeah, so, so that's where we're, that's what we're working on, and we're, we've been uh, in a few months trying to find as, you know all the information that we possibly can, and I still think um, that this should be a major concern of the town, because we have, we have, we are, we are mostly, uh, we get our drinking water from from wells, where pesticides <coughs> seep into. So, um, you know, right now, I think the law just, the state says that we have to um, be uh, pesticide free for, in ball fields for eight to, uh, for ages eight to 12 or something, or K through eight. K, K through eight. Well, that's not enough, obviously. And uh, the, the, uh, I laud um, the Schneiders for, for doing what they, uh, for, for doing what they can about uh, town owned properties, but you know, we need the whole town should to sign up on, uh, to these kinds of, of regulations, so oh. that because or plan make a better plan, so that we protect our water. Okay, uh, sometime in night I, I can't remember the date, but Woodbridge was used as a study subject of a study with regards to pesticide and and and, and if they find it in their water wells and of the yeah. Yeah, well, they even then, have. even then, yep. of the yeah. fifty something that they fifty some uh, uh, wells that they uh, yep. that they study, there was already six percent yeah. already had pesticides. Yeah. Yeah. So I I can't imagine what's happening now. I mean, when you get down to real stuff, you know, there are streets here where every house, every other house has mm -hmm. has a cancer victim. And so there must be something. And something we take, what we breathe, I don't know. But if we can prevent it, or we can do something about it, I think we should sign up to something good. Okay? Thank you so much. Okay. Any other public comments? All right.